Hello, friends. Hey y'all, I'm Afton Jeek here, and welcome to a very special celebration. On July 8th of this year, 2023, this channel officially crossed the 1,000 subscriber milestone, after a little over two years of work, and quite a few uploads, with varying degrees of success and quality. Before we get into the main event, I do really want to say thank you. Thank you to you, the viewers, without whom this achievement literally wouldn't have been possible, and thank you to everyone along the way who has helped me, in big or small ways. I'm thankful that there are some of you who choose to listen to my often overly long ramblings, and in that vein, let's talk about what you're all here for. Yeah, you saw the title, today we're holding a Q&A session. Quite a while ago now, I made a community post here on YouTube asking y'all for questions in preparation for this event, and y'all delivered. So, without further ado, let's get to the questions. From Sapphic Girl 3245 what's your favorite movie, and most importantly, how are you? I'm doing well, if a bit tired from all the art I've had to do for this video. Getting to your other question, that's one that's sort of tough for me to give a single answer to, so instead I'll give you a top five, in no particular order. First off, I gotta mention the 2006 film The Prestige, directed by Christopher Nolan and based on the 1995 novel of the same name by Christopher Priest. I think this is a really underrated film, and when I have to give a favorite film for a survey or icebreaker type thing, this is usually my go-to answer. For all five of these movies, I could probably devote a whole video to why I love them, so I'm really going to have to simplify here. I love The Prestige for its multilinear storytelling, and the fact that it's one of the only movies where you can rewatch it multiple times and have a totally different reading of the material each time. Nolan's work gets a lot of recognition, but this is one that people tend to sleep on. Also, it has Hugh Jackman. As far as the best in my favorite genre, horror, goes, we've got to talk about 2018's Hereditary. Produced by A24, a leader in the arthouse horror genre, and the feature film directorial debut of Ari Aster, Hereditary is, in spite of or maybe because of its fairly low budget, one of the best films I have ever seen. There's an amazing video here on YouTube by an underrated creator called Noam, which spends almost five hours dissecting this one movie, and I think that's just a tribute to how deep it goes. This is the other film of my list of five that I think is greatly improved by multiple rewatches, but there's nothing quite like the first time you watch through it. No spoilers, but I will say I think the last ten minutes are the weakest, except for maybe the very last scene. If you somehow missed this one, go watch Hereditary. By far the most recent film on this list, and one that has left quite a long-term impact on me, is 2022's The Menu, directed by Mark Mylod. I love when a story makes you consider how you, as the audience, interact with it, and this biting dark comedy is all about that. On the surface, it's a film about food, but this film resonated with me because it's about much more than that. It's about creation, and creativity, and breaking down what it's like to be on both sides of that relationship. As someone who has spent quite a lot of time both analyzing and creating content, it's a film that strikes a chord with me in a very personal way, not to mention that it's pretty damn funny. Also, Tyler somehow manages to be one of the most obnoxious but also relatable characters in all of fiction to anyone who has obsessed over another's work without ever putting out something of comparable value, which... yeah. I think most of y'all probably know by now that I love the intersection of horror and mystery, and one of the best films to ever accomplish that is 1982's The Thing directed by the iconic John Carpenter and based on John Campbell's 1938 novella, Who Goes There? While the practical effects are a little dated, I have to give them props for the amount of work they did, and that's not even taking into account the excellent story. The thing is a classic for a reason, and a lot of that boils down to it being the ultimate survival mystery, where the roles of threat and victim can change on a dime. On top of that, it very effectively uses isolation and the fear of the unknown to create a story that's tense all the way through its last shot. 
Finally, I've got to talk about one of my favorite movies growing up, and something that I can still very much appreciate now, which is Steven Spielberg's legendary 1993 film Jurassic Park, based on the 1990 novel of the same name by one of my favorite authors, Michael Crichton. While not a particularly faithful adaptation of the excellent novel, it's nonetheless an amazing story on its own that really explores the darker sides of ambition, greed, and spectacle. On top of that, Jurassic Park was an impressive leap forwards in technology, using a mixture of early CGI and puppetry to create effects that still hold up today. It's just a great movie, and that's all I can say on the matter. From Ganymede135. How are you feeling? I'm feeling happy to be here answering your questions. Also a bit like I regret making the video like this. Editing Afton, how are you holding up? Oh god, um... <laughs> tired? Good? Uh... Excited for this video. I think y'all are gonna like it, and I hope you do. You know better than I do, huh? <laughs> From Eva Gand. Do you have any pets? Not really at the moment, unless you count all of the spiders around here. There is one particularly large one I named Steve that I thought was dead there for a while, but just recently turned back up in his web, so I suppose old Stevie's still up and kicking. The only other named one would be Nicholas, who might have a web somewhere, though I haven't seen it. He does still show up every once in a while, though. To the people who would count any animal you decide to name as a pet, there's mine. From Very Convincing Bear 2529. Opinions on pineapple on pizza. I don't particularly like pineapple at all, and I don't think adding it to dough and sauce improves it much. But I'm also not vehemently against pineapple on pizza. You won't hear me yelling from the rooftops that pineapple on pizza is heresy, but I'm also certainly not going to be reaching for the Hawaiian if there are other options. From Dr. J8673, potatoes or pineapple, choose wisely. Well, I'm slightly intimidated by the ending, but expanding off of what I said in the last question, potatoes win. No contest. Pineapple isn't great, so it couldn't possibly stack up against the vast versatility of the potato. You can fry it about a hundred ways, bake it, mash it, they're great for all of your soup or stew needs, they can even make decent fishing bait. Potatoes also come in far more varieties than is offered by the pineapple, and provide nearly every nutrient your body needs. As long as you keep an eye out for blight, they could possibly feed an entire community for years on their own. I see no situation where the pineapple wins. From Seer of Time 577, what has been your favorite video you've made? Trick question, they're all amazing. First of all, thank you for the compliment, friend. I don't know if I'd agree with it, some of the older videos are pretty hard to watch at this point, but I appreciate it nonetheless. As for my favorite video, there are definitely some strong contenders. Usually my favorite video is whatever my most recent one is, because I try to learn from my mistakes and make each one better, but that's kind of a cop-out, so quality removed, I can think of a couple. My Halloween special last year, Insomni MC or The Campfire, not entirely sure which title applies, was a lot of fun, to the point where I considered doing another for the winter solstice. I've played Minecraft for a long time now, and I've done a fair amount of horror writing, but trying to combine them into one ambient experience was shockingly difficult. I was also working under a time crunch, as I was quite busy with IRL stuff, and on top of that released a lot of videos in a very small amount of time, but I still remember it being pretty fun to make. That's an idea I'd like to try again. My original hour and a half long review of the Magnus Archives has gotta be mentioned here. I remember it took me a long time to make and get everything put together, but I remember being really proud of it when it came out. Now obviously there's a lot I'd change, but for a while there, it was definitely the best video I'd ever produced. To this day, still the longest. There was also that one time I did a whole bunch of math to figure out how long it would take to break into Mumbo Jumbo's impossible bunker. Spoiler alert, it was longer than the lifespan of the universe. As someone who hates doing math, that video was impressively fun to make although I can't even remember what drove me to come up with an idea that absurd. 
Finally, I think my video about saving Minecraft's 1.19 update has got to be at the very least my favorite thumbnail I've ever made. Beyond that, I also loved making all of the models and concepts for that one. It really taught me a lot about how mods operate. I considered doing one for 1.20, but I didn't feel like I had enough improvements to warrant going through with it. The real best video I've made, though, isn't any of those. It's the next one, and it always will be. Gotta keep chasing that best episode, you know? From TNEK years ago. How do you decide what video to do next, slash, what's your video making process like? Really, it depends on the video. Some of them take a long time, some of them don't. Entities Explained, for instance, is usually pretty easy for a couple of reasons. First off, it has a fixed time of release, which means I'm very limited in how much I can put it off. Entities Explained comes out monthly, theoretically at the beginning of every month, which makes it very easy to know, okay, now we're going to upload Entities Explained. That makes the whole decision process much faster, although I will say that Entities Explained being a monthly thing has made me feel forced into choosing it over other videos in the past. Beyond that though, how do I make a video? Well, every video starts as an idea, and I am always looking for new ideas. If I have a thought that could develop into a video, I write it down in a Google Doc, which at this point is 7 pages long. Once it comes time for a new video, if I don't already have an obligation, such as Entities Explained or this 1K special, I go to that ideas document and look through it to see if something catches my eye. I don't have time to do all of them, obviously, so I have to choose carefully which ones make it to the video process and which ones don't. What happens next depends on the type of video. For Afton Plays, which are my gaming videos, I just sit down and record the video. Usually, I'll write and record an intro once that's done, which I prefer to do afterwards so I have some idea of how the recording went down. I've also considered doing scripted voiceovers for some of my plays videos to give them a more professional air, but that would require a lot more work. Even as it stands, plays are some of the hardest videos to make, and all of that comes down to the editing. I try to edit them down as much as I can, since I find long stretches of unedited footage, while sort of appealing in an old school way, to not be very effective at producing entertaining content. To use an example, when I was editing the Cult of the Lamb video, I was dealing with about 6 hours of raw footage, which I then condensed down into a 30 minute video. Even just doing very simple editing, since y'all know I'm not a huge fan of particularly fancy stuff, it took me weeks to do. Once that's done, the rest goes the same, so I'll hop over to talking about Afton Talks videos. These are your video essays, and really most scripted content. What I start with on these is obviously scripting. Depending on the video, some require a lot of work to script, and some don't. The Binned Alien script was an example of the lot of work category, since it required me to do a ton of research into some really obscure stuff. But I think that video also failed because my original scope was just too big. If I ever revisit it, I'll definitely rein it in. Entities Explained are somewhere in the middle for me. Fun fact, it actually requires a lot more research than you'd expect to just steal from the TMA wiki. I do usually cross-reference the info they have listed with the actual episodes to make sure it's accurate, and I also like to check multiple pages on the wiki if I need to find something. For example, the domains that could be attributed to an entity aren't always listed, so I'll usually go to the much more comprehensive domains page. I'll list down and talk about the ones they have, but then I'll also look at the other ones to see if there are any connections I missed. So, in other words, I do my homework on those ones to make sure y'all are getting accurate information. Least difficult from the scripting standpoint are my more opinion-based videos, and obviously, stuff like this. I don't have to do any research to tell y'all if I prefer pineapple or potato, nor do I need to go down the Wikipedia rabbit hole to tell you how I make videos. Once the script is done, I will then go on to either record it, or more likely, I'll get to work on the background art. For most videos, not including this one, I'll have a speed paint of something loosely pertaining to the video in the background while I talk, since I think it's a lot better than just listening to me while watching nothing. Once the art is finished and the video is recorded, we get to editing, which can vary a lot. 
Entities explained are easy to edit. I slap in some music, title cards, relevant pictures when necessary, and make sure that the speed paint playback somewhat lines up with the end of the video, by adjusting speeds and whatnot. It usually takes a few hours, since I basically re-listen to the video multiple times over that process, which by editing standards is not bad. My recent Minecraft video where I ranked every feature in 1.20 was clear on the opposite side of the difficulty scale. Making 300 or so assets if I remember correctly for one video is way more than I usually do, but then I also had to edit the whole thing together in time with what was being said. It was so massive that I had to break it up into five chunks just for my computer to be able to render it, and even then it struggled. It was a lot of fun, but it was also a lot of work. I imagine this one is going to be similar, and I'm not sure if I'm ready for that. Once a video has been edited, I'll usually get to work on a thumbnail. For some videos, the background art is also the thumbnail art, which is very nice. But for others, I have to make art for the thumbnail from scratch. I do try to put some kind of unique art on my thumbnails, with the exception of Entities Explained, because I want the focus to be on the text, and changing it up this late into the game would probably lose some people. I try to make the thumbnail look nice, and stand out well against the YouTube background, though I can never be sure how it'll turn out until it's done. Once the thumbnail is ready, it's time for last checks. Watch the video again to make sure nothing slipped through my fine tooth comb run of a scripted video, including editing mistakes, which usually require me to make the change and then wait through the multi-hour rendering process again, revise the title to make sure it stands out but isn't too clickbaity, create a description for the video to get the point across all that jazz. Once that's done, all that's left is to upload it. Add the script in as a, sometimes slightly incorrect, closed caption option, add any iCards and other in-video features I might need, and schedule it to release as a premiere during the most trafficked hours of the day, which varies all the time. So I need to make sure to check in with Studio once that's done. Then I just hope to see the views roll in. Whew, that was a lot. I hope that's given y'all an insight into how I operate and just how much work goes into even simple videos. Next question. From Elizabeth Davies, 5296. What is the single weirdest thing you have ever witnessed? Ooh, this is a tough one, but it's a good one. I've seen a fair few weird things, but I'm going to confine myself to things I have seen in person and things that were real. So no elaborate cartel torture videos, no hallucinations brought on by sleep deprivation, no strangeness in dreams, and no things that shouldn't exist that I have to convince myself weren't real to be able to sleep at night. Huh. I think it would probably just have to be people. I've seen some weird people, including some who I'm pretty convinced were dangerous. I've also seen some weird items on display in museums for what that's worth, and I imagine that stuff is pretty irrefutably real. I've seen English torture devices, an entire building full of objects which were reportedly haunted, and a massive anatomical display of an entire human cadaver, taken apart for easier viewing. So yeah, that probably wins. And I didn't even have to talk about the woods, because that wasn't real. I will not be answering further questions about it. From JMR1211. Any other fiction podcast recommendations that will rip my heart out like TMA did? I'm feeling a little too mentally well at the moment. I don't listen to too many tragic dramas that'll tear your heart out, sorry to disappoint. As for podcast recommendations, I've been listening to Welcome to Night Vale, which is a classic for an upcoming video, and it's pretty good if you like listening to public radio in a nightmare. Old Gods of Appalachia is a really good horror podcast, especially if you're at all familiar with the Appalachian area. Definitely gives me folk stories told by your old neighbor on the back porch vibes. Oh, and of course, Malevolent. It's great, and it'll definitely get you that gut punch feeling you're looking for. Arthur Lester is a sad little man. From Chardion 9092 How did you find out about the Magnus Archives? As you can probably tell, this marks our descent into all of the TMA questions y'all asked, and I figured a good place to start would be with how I discovered the Magnus Archives. I learned about the Magnus Archives, ironically, right here on YouTube, thanks to a channel I know at least a fair few of y'all follow since YouTube tells me what channels my subscribers watch. 
in December of 2020, Overly Sarcastic Productions posted a trope talk about greatest fears that was actually sponsored by the Magnus Archives. I remember thinking it sounded interesting, and we were still in full lockdown mode then, so I figured I might as well listen to it. I feel like I'd heard of the Magnus Archives before then, but that was definitely the first time I actually gave it a listen. So, uh, yeah. Now you know who you can blame for all of my future TMA content. From Will the Forests. Besides the dark, do you have a favorite entity? I got a couple of questions that asked me what's your favorite entity, or what entity would you serve, and this one has to be my favorite, because of how it's phrased. The way that this is worded either implies that this person thinks the dark is my favorite entity, or this commenter just has a personal grudge against the dark, and I can't tell which is the funnier idea. No disrespect, of course, I just thought it was somewhat comedically phrased. To answer the question, this is a tough pick, and I'm an indecisive person, but I think I've got to go with the web. From a story standpoint, the idea of only one of the fears really having a mind is very interesting. And I love how you can always feel the presence of the web in the plot, even in little ways. Beyond that, though, it's not exactly a secret that I love spiders, they're some of my favorite animals, and I find them to be very interesting to watch. On top of that, I think the themes of manipulation are very, very interesting from a narrative standpoint, and I think the idea of addiction also being tied into the web is something not enough people acknowledge. Also, as someone who is so obsessed with having control over my mind and body that I actively hate the several hours I spend out of control of it for sleeping, the idea of completely losing control of my actions absolutely terrifies me. Oh, also, I like puppets and have had quite an above-average practice at operating marionettes. Overall, the web is by far my favorite, with maybe the extinction or spiral coming in second. From Marigabite Isir 2279, I think that's how you say that name, Least Favorite Entity. Also, what other podcasts do you like? Thought we might as well go from favorite to least favorite entity. I'll be honest, I pretty much like all of them, and there's some way that each manages to get under my skin, but if I had to pick one that was my least favorite, it would probably have to be the corruption. From a fear standpoint, I would literally go running through the woods as a kid collecting bugs, so I don't really associate insects with fear. The other half of the corruption is disease, and these almost fleshy trypophobia fears, which also don't get to me that much. I'm a pretty clean person, but I'm no hypochondriac, so disease doesn't scare me too much. Plus, I was literally raised on medical textbooks, so it's something that seems very natural to me. As for trypophobia, I feel like the effect wears off very quickly. There are some pictures of that variety that can still send shivers down my spine, but most of them are pretty weak, in my opinion. I also think the corruption in story doesn't have that many standout episodes from a fear perspective. Mag6 Squirm stands out as an uncomfortable one, but I think the main corruption episode that gets me is Mag93, Contaminant, and even that is the more psychological aspect. As for your second question, I think I mostly covered it when I answered JMR1211, but I'll also point out that Aaron Mankey's nonfiction podcast, Lore, is particularly good. It's arguably the podcast that got me into podcasts, and exists as an interesting middle ground between true crime and supernatural. I still try to keep up with it when I have time. Another one from JMR1211. What TMA episodes really got under your skin, besides the obvious Lost John's Cave, etc.? I think TMA had a lot of episodes that really got to me, which was something I loved about it because I've been interacting with the horror genre for a long time, arguably my whole life, and it can be pretty easy to feel like things are getting stale. So when something really frightening comes around, I tend to notice. That said, there are a few that I think are worth calling out beyond the obvious. The first one that comes to mind, and one of my favorite episodes of the entire series, is Mag 172, Strung Out. I generally think that season 5 was the least frightening season of the series, but when it hits, it hits deep. And 172 is definitely on that list for me. There's something horrifying about the idea of this awful play on all the worlds a stage, where an audience sits and mocks your downfall as the ghosts of your past harass you from the background. That's all without mentioning the string and hook, basically crucifixions. 
or the thought of injecting spiders into your veins, which made me, about the furthest thing you can get from an arachnophobe, deeply unsettled. On top of that, it's also this haunting pantomime of addiction. The idea that people fall to it not because they choose to, but because they allow it to become routine. 172 really scared the hell out of me on a personal level, and that's a big part of why it might be one of my favorite TMA episodes. On top of that, any of the episodes that deal with being unable to trust your observed reality always scare me. Father Burroughs' story in Mag 19 and 20 definitely got to me, as did Mag 27, a sturdy lock. I'm not sure if Mag 65 binary counts as one of the obvious ones, but that one has definitely made me reconsider my perspective on whether or not I would digitally upload my consciousness. The start of Season 3 also has a few that scared me, with Mag 85 upon the stair being an absurdly overlooked episode that left me with a persisting sense of dread, and Mag 95, Dead Woman Walking, introducing that one phrase the community loves, and I distinctly do not. The moment you die will feel exactly the same as this one, rocked me to my fucking core. And as someone who is very easily prone to bouts of existential dread, that one really wormed its way into my brain. Anyways, yeah, obviously, TMA is a horror podcast. It's scary, and also amazing. From anyone6779, under the desolation video, I might add, favorite TMA episode. Having just talked about what I think the most frightening episode is, I think I might as well go over my favorites, which, yes, aren't one in the same. My favorite episode of TMA is well documented to be Mag 29, Cheating Death and I still stand by that. Cheating Death isn't the scariest episode, but I love the folktale format it has, and the idea of escaping death by taking its place is just the right kind of last second knife twist that helps play into that feeling. On top of that, I've always liked stories of people finding some way to outsmart death, and this is an excellent play on that. I also love that this episode comes back in minor ways, like Daisy and Basira finding a domino player who couldn't die, or that one lukewarm Egypt episode, but it never takes the spotlight again, since I think it would kind of spoil the one-off nature of this story. I stand by my opinion that Mag 29 is the best single episode encapsulation of TMA as a whole. I do think the three-episode combo of Mag 85, Upon the Stair, Mag 86, Tucked In, and Mag 87, The Uncanny Valley, is essentially the perfect summary of TMA, but Mag 29 doesn't do a half-bad job. Also on my list of favorites is, yes, Strung Out, Mag 200, Last Words, and plenty more. From Comrade Luca, which entity do you think you might fall prey to? Basically any of them, honestly. But if I had to pick, probably the I or end. There have been exactly two instances in my life where I was so overwhelmed by fear that I could not function normally for multiple days, and those two events would absolutely fall into the I and end respectively. I'm not going to go more in depth on them, since that's personal business, but I will explain what scares me about each, and why I think I would make for a great fear battery for either. Starting with the I, in case y'all hadn't noticed yet, I have a tendency to get lost in the pursuit of knowledge, to the point where I will often lose track of time just researching topics. The I would literally just have to slide a few hints at something towards me, and it'd have three full conspiracy boards by the end of the week. On top of that, I do not mix well with surveillance or cameras, and the feeling of being watched has very adverse effects on me. Not necessarily in a presentation sense, of course, I'm actually quite good at public speaking, but let's just say that there's a reason I haven't face-revealed and don't intend to. I like my privacy. The end, on the other hand, is pretty simple to explain. I am almost always filled with some degree of existential dread, and death terrifies me. Pretty simple. From Kukadu, which fear would you be an avatar of? On the opposite end, I think you could probably make an argument for any of them especially if you'll have a full compendium of my out-of-context quotes, but I'll do my best. Skipping over the obvious ones that I've already talked about, like web, eye, and end, I think I'd probably have to go with flesh, spiral, or extinction, each for different reasons. Flesh is one that I won't get into too much, so I'll just say one word and go. Cannibalism. 
The spiral is one that I think would work well from a fear standpoint, since I'd definitely be very susceptible to worrying that my reality isn't real. Plus, there's plenty of options with the spiral. Finally, the extinction works from a thematic standpoint. I am fascinated by technology and the adaptations of humanity, and I would absolutely be the idiot in a bombed-out wasteland who, instead of trying to survive, just spends a page ranting about an umbrella. From Fernando Blanco, 2170. What fear would you serve, or would you be more like Jürgen or Mary? So, from a surface level very similar to the last question, but this does introduce a new possibility. None of the above. Uh, honestly, none of the above probably would fit me the best, and Jürgen Leitner in particular is exactly the kind of hubristic idiot that I like to pretend I'm not. So, realistically, I'd probably just wind up getting written out of reality after trying to collect all of the evil artifacts. On the other hand, though, we get hints from Smirk's letter to Jonah Magnus that researching the entities without ever falling to one is somewhat difficult, so who knows. From Ya Girl Carr, 1986. If you were an avatar in the Magnus Archives, what would you be of, and what would your domain be like? We've answered a few what avatar would you be ones so far, but I think this is the first one that makes me consider what I would do from a character and domain standpoint. Huh, alright. I can work with this. There are plenty of domains which feature multiple fears, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll narrow this one down to the web, with, I've realized as I developed this, maybe hints of the eye and extinction in there. My idea would be a miniature city, designed like a massive dollhouse where every building allows onlookers to see the lives of the inhabitants. Inside of the city, every day begins exactly the same, slowly barreling towards some kind of disaster at the end. Everyone remembers each previous day, and yet no matter how hard they try to divert it, the city is always brought to ruin in the same terrible way. Above the miniature city is a giant web of decision trees, always beginning with each victim in their homes on the edges of the city, and working inward to the center where the day invariably ends in tragedy. The residents of the city are powerless to stop it, but they will wake up again tomorrow and try nonetheless. From Random Person That Watches Two questions, what would your fear domain be, and which of the archive staff members would you shove into the coffin? We just answered the fear domains with the last one, but the second question is too funny not to answer. I would 100% shove Season 5 Jonathan Sims into the coffin. Not because he's my least favorite character, but because I'm really curious which power would win. Assuming Helen is telling the truth, we know that John couldn't enter the distortion because he's just too powerful, so I wonder if that also applies to the coffin. Is the all-knowing archivist powerful enough to destroy slash escape from the coffin, or is forever deep below creation the only place the Panopticon's gaze can't pierce? I'm in it for the scientific experiment. From Swarm That Walks, 1775. If you had to choose a Leitner book to have in your house, which would you choose? I think this might be my favorite question in the entire Q&A, no offense to anyone else who submitted one. It's such a creative thing to ask given what knowledge you know I have. Definitely didn't expect to see this while going through the questions, but I am pleasantly surprised. I'd probably have to go with the catalog of the trapped dead, just because I do like the idea of finding a way to escape death, I just don't know if becoming a constantly pained piece of highly flammable skin paper is the answer I'm looking for. I also have no idea what kind of effects that book would have on you. Other contenders would be the security camera instruction manual, since I wouldn't mind being able to remotely view locations, though I am concerned about the whole potential violent death thing. The unnamed spider book, since I reckon it'd make for a wicked silver screen adaptation. And the Sanskrit poetry book, since I could potentially make some money selling small animal bones. Now I have to wonder if the small animal bones market is even something you can oversaturate. From Jonah Dower. Okay, which entity would you be an avatar of, and or have an artifact in real life? So, obviously I've answered the avatar question before, but I really want to home in on that last question about the artifact, because that's another really good question that sort of broadens out the scope of the last one. I will be excluding Lightners from this list, since I've talked about them separately, and because I want to focus on the weird items. I think having Death's game pieces would be neat, since I would absolutely take a set of bone dice or something, but they're not particularly useful beyond just what games you could play with them. 
which seems like an excessively minor use of items provided to you by death. On the utility side, the boatswain's call could be useful in a variety of scenarios, since there are plenty of times that being able to disappear someone without evidence would come in handy. The rock eye would be very good at avoiding security cameras, which I could certainly appreciate for the personal space, and obviously infinite tape recorders would be nice. If we're living in a world where the entities exist, the safe bet is to have the broken camera owned by Mikhail Salesa, on the off chance that the world ends, but at the same time, I would be very alright with having hypnotic, many-hour film cuts to feed particularly annoying guests to, or just spend an afternoon or fifteen watching. From DG Toti, if you could create a fear abomination in TMA, whether it be something associated with a pre-existing canon one or something entirely new, what would it be? They later clarified that this could range from something as simple as a manifestation to something as complex as an entirely new entity, so let's get to work. First off, I want to address the idea of adding new entities, because I personally think it's pretty unnecessary. Sure, there are spots where you could split things off to create more granular fears, like separating sickness and insects, or taking the sea from the vast, lonely, dark, and buried to make a sea-specific fear, but I think there are very few things that couldn't fit somewhere in the 15 outlined fears. If y'all come up with anything, feel free to tell me in the comments, I'm curious to see if there are any serious outliers. As for what I would add, I've got a couple of ideas that might work. I always thought it was weird that Gabriel was the only artist we saw, so I like the idea of adding others. The trash sculptures idea from that one Extinction episode was cool, bring that back in the form of a character. A painter who serves the stranger but can't quite get faces right? How about an animator who can literally bring things to life, or a fiction novelist who keeps accidentally writing true crime? Or, alternately, what about doing something with careers? An engineer whose cars seem to keep getting into fiery crashes. A tax collector who comes for his literal pound of flesh. On the monster front, I always thought it might be cool to have some kind of stranger almost animals a la not deer. Or a dark monster, based on hide-behinds, which can hide behind a tree or lamp post or other item, no matter what angle you look at it from. There's literally infinite possibilities. These are just the ones I could quickly think of off the top of my head. From Logan is a nerd, 5566. How did you get into TMA and Minecraft? What's a piece of art you feel proud of? Definitely show it off. Do you have any projects slash series you're excited about for the channel or elsewhere? Is there another topic you'd like to cover in the future? Alright, plenty to talk about here, so let's get right to work. How did I get into TMA? See my previous answer to Cardian 9092's question. How did I get into Minecraft? My cousin introduced it to me, I went, oh, that's really neat, and somehow I still haven't put it down since. As for a piece of art I'm proud of, I have a few, so we can talk about those. I have always really liked doing pen and ink drawings, and there is this one really cool landscape piece I did for an art class that actually feels very fleshy. I can't share it here, because if I did I'd wind up doxing myself, but that's probably the piece of art I'm most proud of. As for stuff y'all can see, I always really like doing the thumbnail aftons, that's something I have a lot of fun with. As for completed pieces, I'm really proud of the Manuela Dominguez art I did for my Dark Explained video. I think that's one of the best ones I've ever done. Do I have projects for the future? Yes. I mean, I can't share them all, or else we'd lose out on the surprise, but I do have a few video ideas I'm willing to share. At the moment, I'm considering doing a video essay about analog horror, I have a few malevolent and TMA theory videos in the works, plus my thoughts on Protocol before it releases, that alien script or another folklore slash conspiracy video, and anything else that my brain comes up with. Hope this helped. From Mm-hmm Adaliwal. This is my first time in a Q&A, so excuse the question. What is your favorite and least favorite fear? What is your favorite and least favorite episode? What is your favorite and least favorite character? And finally, if there is one thing you could change about the Magnus Archives, what would it be? This can be anything from expanding the role of a character, having an element of the story you liked that didn't come back return, removing something you didn't like, 
or even, if you're feeling creative, all of the above and more. Whatever you want, man. Sorry this is very long, but I got excited because of how good your videos are, and thank you for the answers. Well, you're definitely right about one thing. This is very long. Not that I mind that, of course. It gives me plenty more to talk about. First of all, thank you for the compliment. And without further ado, let's answer as many of these as we can. Favorite and least favorite fears have already been answered, as has favorite episodes, so we can skip over those and move on to the next one. My least favorite episode is easily Mag 23, Schwarzwald, which I believe is the worst episode of the Magnus Archives by far. It is dull, empty, purposeless, and is the only episode of the series that I think is not only bad, but I actively hate. Also, the only episode that I really have to consider whether or not I want to listen to when I do my podcast re-listens. Next up, characters. My favorite member of the archival staff is, drumroll please, Daisy Tonner. Daisy is such a fascinating character, as someone who knows that what she does is bad and still continues to go through with it. She's interesting enough before Season 4, but after she returned from the coffin, she finally managed to edge out Elias Bouchard for that first place. Also, she and John have a great dynamic in Season 4, which was actually one of my favorite parts of the season. As for my least favorite member of the archival staff, it was really close, but I've got to go with Sasha James. Not to be confused with not Sasha. My only issue with Sasha is that we just didn't see enough of her to even be a main character which I think is pretty unfortunate. Second place probably goes to Martin, which I know a lot of people take as heresy, but I personally am just not a huge fan of Martin Carton Blackwood. I like his dynamic with John, but I think he's a little weak and not a little annoying on his own. Definitely gets better as the seasons go on, though. Finally, the one thing I would change in TMA, and it is a very simple change. I would bring back Decker as an avatar of the Extinction in Season 5. More than that, I would expand the Extinction's role in Season 5. I am not a huge fan of Season 4, and I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that the main threat of the season, the emergence of the Extinction, never really amounts to much. We get one episode in Season 5 where Martin and John wander through a wasteland domain and say, huh, I guess the extinction probably was a thing, or maybe not, who knows, and then move on. I would have loved to see more out of the extinction in Season 5, maybe imply that by bringing about the change it has only fed people's fear of the extinction. There was literally an entire episode talking about how the world will eventually run out of fear and everything will die, and they didn't do anything extinction related with that knowledge. I think the perfect excuse to get more Extinction in there would be to bring back Decker in some form as an Extinction Avatar. It would probably be hard to justify, since the whole idea is that Avatars have to choose to join their patrons, and Decker seems too good to have made that choice, but I do think there are ways around it. What if it wasn't actually Decker, but rather a reflection of him? revealed not to be an avatar, but a complex manifestation brought about by the fear he inadvertently spread of the Extinction's manifestation. There's an idea. I don't know. I just wanted to see more out of it. Thank you for all of your questions, and let's move on to the semi-final one of the night. From Jedi Mind Glitch 89 will you be listening to the Magnus Protocol? No. Okay, okay, yeah, I will be. At least to start. And you can bet that I'll talk about it on the channel. I say to start because, I'll be honest, I have some concerns about Protocol, and I foresee the real potential for it to be a lifeline-seeking money grab for a company which was basically relying on its predecessor. But I really do hope it turns out good, or at least very entertainingly bad, because either way I've got something to talk about. What really worries me is that it'll just be mediocre. That it won't live up to TMA, which would be basically impossible, but that it also won't be truly awful, so it'll be forgotten pretty fast. I also worry about the effects it'll retroactively have on the Magnus canon, and feel quite concerned that something will get damaged. Either way, for now, I wait for its release to make any judgments, and the recent teasers have restored some of my faith in the project, but I can't be sure until it releases. 
So, yes, to answer your questions, I will definitely be listening to and making content about the Magnus Protocol before, during, and after its release. From Dr. No Name 2098 Besides it being a phenomenal story, are there deeper reasons in life you've gotten so attached to TMA? I think as far as questions to close out on go, this is probably a pretty good one. Why did I become attached to the Magnus Archives? It's a good question. I don't even really know the answer to it, but I can speculate. First of all, yeah, it is a phenomenal story. That's a big part of it. But I've heard plenty of phenomenal stories, and I haven't made videos every month for almost a year talking about them. There definitely is something different about TMA. I think most of it comes down to how TMA classifies fear. Ever since I was very young, I've been fascinated by fear. As a little kid, I was scared of just about everything, and looking back, I think I was so fascinated by horror because it was just fear diluted down to its base components. The boy who was scared of everything could suddenly have control over the things that scared him, and really figure out why those things seemed scary. But unfortunately, a lot of horror doesn't do that. It doesn't want to analyze fear, it just wants to wallow in it or quickly throw it in the faces of audiences for a cheap dollar. But TMA always felt different. There's a reason that I started this video with the movies that I enjoy, and it's because that's the media I compare to the Magnus Archives. Not just those movies, though. All of the books I've read and stories I've heard, and I'll be entirely honest, TMA is still one of the best. I think that's because TMA understands what I want out of a horror experience. Horror is a lot like comedy, and in many ways it's true that, like a joke, a scare can be killed by dissecting it. But TMA's horror doesn't do that. It makes a mystery that encourages you to break it down and analyze why things are scary and what categories those fears land in. It's a way to talk about fear and really examine the things that frighten us. There's a reason that, after TMA, it becomes really easy to start categorizing other horror media into the entities. They basically cover everything you might need, and they're a great way to talk about and understand fear. So, yeah, there's my reason. And also about as emotionally vulnerable as y'all are ever going to see me get. Now let's finish this video. Thank you all so much for watching, for asking your questions, and for helping us get to 1,000 subscribers. If you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the comments, and I'll do my best to respond to them. Also, if everything has gone to plan, this video should be in a very different style to the other content I normally post. Feel free to tell me what you think of that as well. It's very experimental, but I figured y'all might appreciate seeing it. For now, I just have a few expressions, but I'm absolutely willing to add more or change the existing if y'all want to see that. I do hope you've enjoyed the video and every other one I've made, and I'll be sure to keep making them for as long as y'all keep watching them. I've been Afton G. Keir, this has been the 1000 subscriber special, and good night, YouTube people.